All right, so welcome everybody to the first wireless analog, sorry, wireless RF and analog project uh, lecture. So I think I mentioned in the email I sent that we'll be covering, uh, let's see, an overview of the wireless system, as well as uh, some modulation basics and amplifier basics. So depending on which classes you've taken, this may or may not be a review of some of the material you've already covered. Oops. But hopefully it'll be valuable to everyone. Okay. Is everyone seeing the presentation all right? Any acknowledgement in the crowd there? Yes, looks okay. good. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. All right, so we'll, we'll begin here. Um, so I kind of mentioned this already. So I, I've basically said this multiple times, uh, once at the project info session, the general, meet board, uh, general meeting for IEEE, but the idea of this project is that uh, we're going to design a wireless communication system at the transistor level and learn how the circuits work as well as the uh, digital communication signal processing techniques. And hopefully at the end, we'll actually fabricate and measure this stuff, but I can't guarantee anything there uh, for obvious reasons. So uh, let me just briefly cover the survey results we got here. Uh, thank you to everyone that filled it out. I think there's 23 people out of the 28 in the project. So. First question, what type of lecture style do you prefer? Uh, by and large, people like the hybrid approach. So I'll, I'll try to do that. Um, this particular lecture today will mostly be PowerPoint, but I'll, I can change it up for the future. Okay, next one, what lecture times people like? Uh, it was kind of fortuitous, people liked this one, Thursday, six to eight. Um, so I kind of randomly chose it. Okay. And I think if anybody objects, I'll keep it to Thursday, six to eight. Um, I might try switching it around to like every other week or something like Wednesday, one day, Thursday, the other day, but Thursday seems to work the best for the most people. And of course it's recorded. So if you can't make it, then you can always watch the recording. Okay, so uh, any questions about the survey? Any objections? If not, we'll move on. Okay, so uh, one of the questions on the, uh, or well, let me save that for a second. So it, for wireless communications, um, we wanna send information over the air and we send information over the air through electromagnetic waves, of course. So question is, how do we represent information? And so in analog modulation or, uh, for example, AM radio or FM radio, so music or uh, news broadcast, for example, that information is represented through an analog waveform. Uh, so audio would be some signal which has a frequency spectrum uh, ranging from roughly 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Um, and in digital modulation, you represent that information using uh, binary in general. So this figure on the top right here is just a, an example of some random, random binary data I made up. So in, in this case, a, a level of positive one might represent a one and negative one might represent a zero in binary. And you know, uh, some string of binary would represent, uh, could represent many things like audio, pictures, um, anything really. So we, we have a nice kind of squarish looking wave here. The question is how do we transmit it? And so the problem is that you can't just send the signal out as it is through an antenna or something. And the reason that is, is because uh, 
there's kind of two main issues here. One is antennas don't work at low frequencies. It turns out that the lower frequency your signal is, the larger your antenna needs to be to transmit at that frequency. So if you consider normal cell phone communication, that works at, you know, on the order of one gigahertz. And, uh, and th those antennas are the size of your cell phone, of course. And this digital information here might be on the order of a few megahertz, let's say, which is a thousand times smaller in, in frequency, which means that your antenna needs to be a thousand times bigger in order to transmit that information effectively. So you can imagine an antenna a thousand times bigger than your phone won't work uh, for normal purposes. You can't carry that. So that, that's why you can't do that. The other thing is you don't want to interfere with other transmissions. So if everybody is transmitting your, let's say one megahertz binary signal here, they're obviously going to interfere with each other because they're all at the same frequency. And they're all going to overlap and you can't decipher whose information is whose and it becomes a whole mess. So the solution to this is to use uh, carrier signals and modulations. And the you know, big picture here is that we can choose a carrier signal, which is say a sinusoidal signal at some frequency, let's say one gigahertz. And we can modulate that signal uh, in some method with our information here. Maybe it's either digital or analog, the same for both. And what effect that has is moving your, uh, let's say low frequency signals up to the carrier frequency area. Uh, we have a question in the chat here. So the 2.3 gigahertz Wi-Fi option spectrum gives us is objectively worse than five gigahertz especially going through walls, right? Um, that, that's an interesting question. So you're asking about the difference between low, lower frequency Wi-Fi and higher frequency Wi-Fi. Um, it's not 2.3, it's 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, I don't know if I can share this here. Um, but so the, the standard Wi-Fi is 2.4 gigahertz, which allows you to use um, it requires a larger antenna than five gigahertz Wi-Fi. Um, however, higher frequencies tend to get uh, larger attenuation when they go through objects. So uh, it's kind of the opposite of what you said. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that later. So <laughs> back, back to the presentation here. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so modulation basically moves your low frequency uh, information to a higher frequency that allows it to be transmitted through an antenna and as well as not to interfere with other people because people can choose different carrier frequencies. Um, let's see, oh, okay. So the interesting thing here is the bottom right figure. I took the Fourier transform of the upper figure and uh, I mean, well, let me uh, open it up for some audience participation. Can somebody say what the Fourier transform of square wave looks like? Anyone? Oh, we, we've got an answer here. It's a sync function, yes. So it's not quite a sync function because uh, you really have a Fourier series, not a Fourier transform. But in general, yes, it looks like a sync function. And so here you can see this uh, Fourier transform kind of looks like a sync function, but it's kind of a distorted sync function. And that's because uh, this is not a pure square wave um, because the, you know, the, the width of each pulse is different for each pulse because there's some randomness to the data. You can think of it that way. So anyway, uh, you get something roughly sign a uh, sync function looked like, and uh, you have most of your signal energy centered or concentrated at lower frequencies here. So you can see, you know, higher level here corresponds to higher signal energy, and we can uh, 
you know, say there's some bandwidth to that signal, which is uh, uh, mainly this first lobe here called the main lobe. And anything past that we can say is, you know, it's lower energy, it's not so important, and we can ignore it for most purposes. And so you can see uh, this energy is all centered at lower frequencies. Now the effect that modulation has is to move all of this to higher frequencies. And so we'll, we'll see that shortly. Uh, so one of the questions on the graph application was to describe how amplitude modulation works. And uh, let, let, let me put it this way, based on the answers I got, I, I think I should <laughs> review the concept. Um, okay, so the simplest form of amplitude modulation is uh, called double sideband suppressed carrier modulation, which is a very fancy name for saying we multiply our message signal, which is the information, by a carrier signal. And so here, here I'm representing the message signal as just the cosine uh, at frequency omega m. And the carrier signal is a, a cos another cosine at frequency omega c. And the effect of multiplying those two together gets you two cosines, one at omega m plus omega c and one at omega m minus omega c. And so you might ask, well, our, we never actually want to send cosines because cosines don't actually convey much information. They're just a cosine. Remember here, here we had a, a square wave looking thing. A square wave is not a cosine. Well, um, for those of you who have taken EE102, uh, we can represent any signal essentially as a summation, uh, infinite summation of cosines and sines. And so this kind of gives this uh, equation here, kind of gives you an, an idea of what's happening inside the frequency domain when we modulate a signal using this double sideband suppressed carrier modulation. Uh, in effect, we're taking our message signal at omega, or that's centered around a low frequency and we're adding that low frequency omega m to the carrier frequency, and we're also taking the difference. So when we're when we do this kind of operation, um, you're, you're you basically have two uh, frequency components. One is lower than the carrier frequency. One is higher than the carrier frequency. And uh, I think I have a nice picture of that shortly. Yeah, so here I'm just giving another example of a message signal. In this case, it's two sinusoids. And here is the Fourier transform of that. Um, negative frequencies look exactly the same as positive frequencies. So you only need to consider one half of this picture. Let me, let me turn on the pointer here. Does anybody have any questions, by the way, so far? Okay, so anyway, here, here is an example of a message signal. And we have a carrier. This is just another sinusoid at a higher frequency, so in this case, five hertz. And when we multiply the two of them together, we get those sum and difference frequency components. So we have two uh, difference components, which are these two, from the two components of the message signal we have two sum components. We have a question. Can you explain why there are two frequencies? Yeah, so this is the message signal, which is composed of two frequencies. It's just an arbitrary message signal I came up with. In this case, one at one hertz and one at 1.3 hertz. And you see there's four spikes here. When you take the Fourier transform of a, a signal, you get things at positive frequencies, you get things at negative frequencies. And it turns out when you take the Fourier transform of a real signal, which is most signals you deal with, um, the positive frequency magnitude is always equal to the negative frequency magnitude. So in effect, you can ignore the negative frequencies because they're an exact replica of the positive frequencies. So it's just um, redundant information. 
uh, the phase is different, but uh, that's not not too important uh, here, at least. So anyway, we, we if you only look at the right half, uh, yes. So if I keep going here, if you again, if you ignore the negative frequencies, and you only look at the positive frequencies, you see there's four spikes. Now two of those spikes are from omega c minus omega m. And that, that gives you the five minus uh, one hertz and five minus 1.3 hertz, which are the 3.7 and four hertz components. And then the omega c plus omega m, which is the five plus one and five plus 1.3, gives you the six hertz and the 6.3 hertz, which are these two here. Um, and then, of course, negative frequencies is just a, a copy of that. So if you were to consider the square wave with the, the digital signal earlier, you'd see the exact same thing if you multiplied that by the cosine. You'd have, uh, you basically, remember, you had this sync function looking thing. So what would happen is that that sync function looking thing would be centered around five hertz instead of zero hertz. And once that sync function looking thing is centered around five hertz, you can transmit it on an antenna and do all your wireless communication goodness. And so that's the overall goal of modulation. There's some secondary goals and we'll, we'll go into that. Um, so yeah, so that, that was double sideband single uh, suppressed carrier modulation, which is a form of amplitude modulation uh, and an analog modulation. So now we get into digital modulation. So here, instead of multiplying uh, our carrier by you know, a simple analog waveform, now we're multiplying by a digital waveform. So it's, it's kind of the same thing. So in this case, we have our raw data, which we convert to bits. And we take a string of bits that is of length m, little m. So, uh, and then we, we map each string of bits to what's called a symbol. And th this is a really simple concept that is hard to get initially, but once you get it, it's really easy. Um, so I, I have an example here. So let's say we have a, our digital signal. We have one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, which is simple enough. And let's say we uh, say a one has a analog value one and a zero has an analog value zero. And when we multiply this digital signal by a sinusoidal signal, we get what's below. And so anybody have any questions about that? Okay, so here I'm saying that one corresponds to part of a cos uh, sinusoid and a zero corresponds to a flat line. And uh, in this case, the, the unique string of bits is of length one and it can either be a one or a zero. And a symbol is either a sine wave or nothing, a flat line. So I, this is called on-off keying. That's the name of this type of modulation. And we have one bit per symbol because each bit corresponds to one type of uh, thing we're transmitting. And uh, we, we say this uh, modulation scheme has what's called a capital M equals two. Capital M is number of different types of symbols. So in this case, one is sine wave and the other one is flat line. Lowercase m is the number of uh, bits that are assigned to each symbol. So in this case, there's one bit per symbol. And there's a pretty easy formula, it's just log base two of big M is little m. So if I had four symbols, let's say, could somebody tell me how many bits are assigned to each symbol? Uh, 
someone? Two, yes. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. So does anybody have a question about what a symbol is? Because if it's important to understand that now rather than later. We're a quiet bunch here. <laughs> Wait, so if we had the uh, two, two bits per symbol, like what would that look like from a, I guess, a waveform perspective? Good question. So like, I don't know if direct multiplication would work in that case. Like, right. So you, you're correct. Multiplying the digital signal by a sine wave will only get you a modulation with capital M equals two. So if you wanted to have two bits per symbol, which is capital M equals four, you have to do something slightly more complicated. Uh, let me see. Let me just go like this here. Pull out paint for lack of better whiteboarding thing. Um, let, let, let me draw a few symbols. So let's say here's one. Here's one sinusoid. So I'll, I'll call this symbol one. Uh, here's another sinusoid. However, the amplitude is bigger than symbol one. I'll call this symbol two. And here's yet another sinusoid. Pardon my crummy pictures. Uh, this is the same thing as sinus uh, symbol one. However, I flipped its phase by 180 degrees. And then finally, I have to make a fourth symbol, symbol four, which is the same thing as symbol three, except twice the amplitude. So these are uh, four distinct symbols. And we can assign a string of bits to each one. So let's say I call this one zero, zero. I call this one zero one. This is one zero and one one. So every time I want to send two ones, I'll send symbol four. Every time I want to send two zeros, I'll send S one and so on. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, in this case, it's not a direct multiplication of uh, your uh, digital waveform to your sinusoid. But the, the effect is the same because we're centering the information around the carrier frequency, which is the frequency of this sinusoid. Okay, uh, okay so now back here. Ah. Okay. So everyone else good here? Um, really, what's the point of ever having more than two bits per symbol? I mean, like, it's a binary system. Why would you ever need other, like, more than this? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So let me, let me actually go back to the paint here. Um, let's say it takes, uh, you yeah. know, let's say this period here is T naught or just call it T, TS, the symbol period, which is the amount of time it takes to send one symbol. Um, if we can send one bit in TS, then the number of bits we can send per second is uh, one over TS, right? So let's say TS is uh, one millisecond. And that means if we have one bit per symbol, we can send 100, uh, 1,000 bits per second because one over one millisecond is 1,000. But now let's say we send two bits per symbol. And now we can send two bits per one over TS, uh, which gives you 2,000 bits per second. So in effect, the more bits we can shove into a single symbol, 
the, the faster we can communicate. Got you. Now, of, of course, there's a limitation. You can't shove an infinite number of bits into a single symbol. And so the main limitation is the, the more bits you have per symbol, the more your entire system will be affected by noise or just like random variations. You know, your, your thing is actually going to look like this when you receive it. And uh, at some point, this noise will make one symbol look kind of like another. And so you might interpret when, when you receive that symbol on your receiver, you might interpret it as looking like another symbol, which means you'll have some error in the bits you receive. And so it's a trade off between how fast you want to communicate and what tolerance you have to bit errors. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. Okay. So, it's a good question. Um, okay, so now I'm, uh, you may recall these slides that I posted on Facebook a while ago. Uh, I just want to talk over them because I, I think it'll give more insight. So, this block diagram here is a uh, basically a pretty generic looking wireless communication system. And so we, we talked about this stuff here. We generate bits, the bits are converted to a, uh, symbols, and then we modulate those symbols onto a carrier, which these two steps are kind of, you know, they merge into the same step sometimes. So let me give some more detail to all of this. So first the bit generation, uh, we kind of talked about this. Um, I, I showed you on off keying uh, in the previous slide, but we'll be using this project is called binary phase shift keying, which is pretty similar to on off keying. The only difference is, uh, let me go like this. I'm going to call a, so that this would be binary one here. So this would be binary zero. Where'd my cursor go? Um, Oh, there it is. So this would be binary zero here, but I'm going to call it minus one. And now when I multiply this to our sinusoid, instead of getting zeros, like a flat line for the zero bit, now I'm getting a sinusoid, except the phase is flipped by 180 degrees, which is to say I'm multiplying by minus one. And I won't go into the theory, but this has advantages to on-off keying. It allows us to communicate faster uh, and with fewer errors. But it's, it's still a very simple modulation and a very reliable modulation. And sure enough, it's used in 5G communications, uh, along with a few other types of modulations. So it's definitely relevant to uh, you know, current day industry, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, but that, that's, uh, that's what we're going to be using here. So next we modulate. Um, yeah, the same slide here, basically. So we generate the symbols at baseband, which is to say, uh, you know, centered around zero hertz. You, you, the, the term baseband will come up a lot. Uh, baseband just means uh, the low frequency version of things before you modulate up to higher frequencies. And so in terms of analog audio signals, that might be a baseband is the 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz signal, which is what you actually hear. And so then we modulate the baseband, uh, you know, binary information onto the carrier signal through the use of these symbols, basically. And after we generate the symbols, which is you know the, the waveform in the bottom here, we can apply some additional digital filtering techniques and pulse shaping. Uh, 
and I'll, I'll talk about those in future lectures. Uh, and that, that's where all our digital signal processing will come into play. Okay, so that's all done in the digital domain. We haven't done anything analog yet. So this is all done on a computer or a microprocessor. So at some point you gotta go from digital to analog and that's what our digital to analog converter does. It's a very fitting name. So that's a component. Uh, in our case, it will be integrated into the microcontroller that we're gonna be using. In this case, the STM32F405, which is what's used in MicroMouse and uh, similar to the one used in Aircopter. And so these digital to analog converters have a maximum frequency they can output. In this, in our case, it's roughly one megahertz. And uh, we're going to be transmitting at 27 megahertz. There's a, there's a reason why I chose this particular number. And I'll, I'll talk about that later. But you'll notice that one megahertz is much lower than 27 megahertz. And that's a problem. So we need some way of increasing our signal frequency from what the DAC can output, the, the digital analog converter. And that is what up conversion is. So up conversion is basically a process where you take a signal of a lower frequency and shift it up to a higher frequency. So that this is, you might think that's very similar to what I was talking about with carrier modulation and you'd be right, it's a pretty similar process, except in this case, we're doing it in the analog domain. We're not doing it in the digital domain. So the way it works, uh, if you look at this, uh, the, the right diagram here, this, this, this picture here is going from right to left kind of. So we, we take our output from our DAC and we feed it into this component here. This component is called a mixer it, all it does is it multiplies the two, two inputs together and gives you the product at the output. So the other input is what's called a local oscillator. All that is, is uh, it's a circuit component that outputs a sinusoid at a single frequency. So what we're doing here is we're taking our uh, modulated signal from the DAC, we're multiplying it by a sine wave or a cosine, and we're taking the output product. And you might recall from double side sideband single uh, suppressed carrier modulation, what you get is these sum and difference frequencies. Uh, so if our DAC frequency is roughly one megahertz and our local oscillator is FLO for a local oscillator, then we'll get some, uh, two outputs. One is at FLO minus the uh, output from the deck, in this case, FIF, and one at FLO plus FIF. And that's, this is the difference frequency and this is the sum frequency. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it, yeah, okay. So in effect, we've taken our, our lower frequency coming from the deck and shifted it up to these two frequencies here. And the signal at all if the uh, RF1 and RF2 um, spikes are farther away from the low there? Could you say that again? I didn't get the beginning. Oh, does the does it affect the signal at all if the RF1 and RF2 spikes are farther away from the low signal? I feel like it's not very ap like adaptable this particular up conversion method because like what happens if this RF1 and RF2 spikes are really far away from low because the IF frequency is higher or already closer to low or something like that, or? Yeah, that, that's that's a good point. So uh, in our system, we have the we have the ability to choose FLO to be whatever we want. So if uh, in this case, FIF is around one megahertz and say we wanted um, one of these two sum and difference frequencies to end up at 27 megahertz which is where we're transmitting. Then I might choose the LO to be 26 megahertz. And then uh, the one megahertz plus 26 megahertz will end up here at 27 megahertz 
and there'll be another copy at 25 megahertz. Right, so that's 26 plus one and 26 minus one. Okay. And, and, and these are these two things are kind of identical to each other, the RF1 and RF2. So what we do in practice is that we filter out uh, the one we don't want. And so we're just left with one of these. So in the example I just gave, we filter out the 25 megahertz copy because we, we only want the 27 megahertz one. So you said if the FIF was too close to the FLO, um, that would be an example of a poor design. <laughs> and you'd want to rethink where you're putting the FLO. Now, in the case of the opposite process, where you want to go from a high frequency to a low frequency, that thing is called down conversion, as opposed to up conversion. And here, you uh, typically your RF, your FRF, which is the input in this case, not the output, will be close to the FLO. And so the difference between these two will be a, a relatively low frequency. So, so say we uh, receive a 27 megahertz signal, we want to bring it down to a lower frequency that our microcontroller can process. So say one megahertz or something. Then we receive a 27 megahertz signal, we choose our FLO to be 28 megahertz, and then 28 minus 27 gets us our one megahertz. Uh, we also get a, a 27 plus 28, and that'll end up somewhere over here, way off the chart. And we can filter that out if we don't want it. Uh, so does that make sense to everyone? example. Say that again? Can you repeat the down conversion example one more time? Yeah, so so say we receive a 27 megahertz signal and we can only process signals up to one megahertz because uh, the faster the signal is, the harder it is for the processor to keep up with it essentially. So we want to convert our 27 megahertz signal and bring it down to uh, one megahertz. So remember that when, when we multiply the RF and the LO, we get the sum and difference with frequencies. So if we make the difference frequency such that it ends up at a lower frequency, let's say one megahertz, then we're, we're golden. So if I get 27 here, I wanna choose 28 here. And then the difference between these two is one megahertz. And the sum, which is 27 plus 28, that gets you, what, 55 megahertz or so, which is off the chart here. You can just filter that out and ignore it. Okay. And we're, we're just left with uh, this guy. Um, I should also mention IF stands for intermediate frequency. Uh, RF stands for radio frequency. And so typically RF is the higher frequency, IF is the lower frequency. Okay, so, so at, at this point here, we're at a higher frequency. We're at, let's say, 27 megahertz. Now we need uh, to do what's called power amplification. And so what, what this process does is that we're taking a, uh, a low level signal in terms of amplitude, um, voltage amplitude, and we're amplifying it up such that by the time it gets to the antenna, the signal is strong enough that it'll overcome any attenuation it'll experience along the, the way to the receiver. Um, so I, I put it more technically here. Our DAC has a large output impedance. I think in the case of the microcontrollers we're using, it's around 15 kilo ohms. And the antenna has a low input impedance. So for those of you that are experts in network analysis, but you have one resistor, two resistors, and some signal source here. Sorry, the drawing is so bad here. Uh, and let's say this is the source resistance 
and this is the load resistance. In this case, the source resistance is around 15 kilo ohms. So I'll say this is 15 K. And RL, which is the antenna, uh, has a impedance of roughly 50 ohms. And the reason it's 50 ohms, uh, I'll get to later, but just go with me here. So this is 15 kilo ohms and 50 ohms. So if we're sending out some signal V, we have a nice voltage divider here, right? So can somebody tell me what's the voltage here? Almost equal to V. Uh, the opposite. Or, uh, no, OK, I got it backwards. No, it should be close to 0. Right. So it's going to be V times 50 over 15 K plus 50, which is pretty much 0. And so that means uh, if we hook up our antenna straight to our deck, uh, we're going to get basically zero signal being transmitted because the antenna is loading down the DAC so much that it, nothing gets outputted. So you need some sort of uh, way to convert or increase the amplitude of the signal that gets to the antenna. And to do that, we use amplifiers. And this particular amplifier is called a power amplifier because we want the power going to the antenna to be large. So th th this is the part of the system where you're dealing with higher powers. Uh, so it, you know, depending on the system, high power might mean different things. So if you were dealing with like military radar, that might be many kilowatts or megawatts. Uh, and if you have any sense of electrical power, uh, megawatt is a, a lot of power. <laughs> a kilowatt is also a lot of power, but for like cellular communication, a lot of power might be a few watts. So like cell phones are transmitting something on the order of like hundreds of milliwatts or something. Uh, in this case, we're going to be transmitting even less, somewhere in the neighborhood of like a few milliwatts. But still the problem uh, hold, uh, is still here where we need some way of uh, amplifying our signal to that milliwatt level in order to transmit. And so we'll, once we get to amplifiers more, we'll, we'll talk more about this. All right, so once our signal is amplified, then we transmit it through the antenna. Um, if you haven't taken a like 101B, ECE 101B or 162A, the antenna kind of seems like some a mystical device that somehow allows you to convert uh, your voltages to electromagnetic waves. Um, and they are kind of cool, but <laughs> uh, the, the way the antenna works is, uh, um, remember from physics that a changing uh, magnetic field or electric field can produce electromagnetic waves. And you might think in a regular circuit, just you know, on a PCB, uh, uh, why, do, why doesn't that act like an antenna? And the answer is it does. However, um, in order for antennas to radiate efficiently, the length of the, the antenna or the size of the antenna needs to be roughly comparable to the wavelength of the, the the uh, a signal you're trying to transmit. So remember at the beginning of this whole spiel, I said that the lower frequency you're trying to transmit, the larger your antenna needs to be. So lower frequency means larger wavelength. And that means your, ante your antenna needs to be roughly the same as the wavelength. And so that, that's where that idea comes from. Uh, you, you can kind of think of it like, uh, if you imagine a, like a, a, from like physics 1B or something, if you have a rope and you're, you're waving the rope up and down at some sinusoidal rate, uh, if the rope is, if the length of the rope 
is a, a one wavelength of that, you know, the frequency you're waving it up and down at, then you'll get some standing wave on the rope where you get like a node at the middle or something and there's two points that go up and down. That's a similar idea to what's happening with the antenna. And uh, I won't go into the physics, but that allows you to get efficient uh, radiation of electromagnetic waves. And it turns out that when you do that, the input impedance of the antenna happens to be roughly 50 ohms. It's actually closer to, for, cer for certain antennas, it's different, but it's, it's around that level. Uh, and the other thing is the, the antenna, because it's uh, very large compared to the wavelength of the signals you're dealing with, uh, you have to take into account what are called transmission line effects. And uh, well, I'll go into that later, but basically we need our, our power amplifier to present a, a low impedance to the antenna. Uh, which is kind of what I mentioned before. We have a question. Is the length of our antenna is where you got the 27 megahertz from now? No, so the, the length, the, the 27 megahertz um, has to do with what frequency spectrums are available to transmit on. So uh, in the United States at least, and mostly around the world, uh, certain frequencies are reserved by certain people and it's all controlled by the FCC in the United States. And the FCC has allocated the 27 megahertz frequency for general use. That's called the citizen radio band. Uh, it was originally used by like truckers and uh, you know, like people trying to communicate on the road. So basically, uh, it's free to communicate on this frequency, and people won't go after you if you uh, are, you know, you're transmitting. If you're transmitting at, say, like, uh, uh, let's see, I think it's like 900 megahertz or something, which is what one of the cellular communication uh, frequencies is. Uh, whoever owns that frequency spectrum will, will sue you to the ground um, until you stop transmitting. <laughs> uh, and so that, that's why 27 megahertz was chosen. It's also a low, lower frequency compared to the other open frequency bands. So it's not that hard to build circuits for. The, in general, the higher frequency you go, the harder it is to uh, build that circuit. What is the bandwidth of the free use band? So the, well, the 27 megahertz citizen radio band is broken down into different channels. And I believe each channel uh, is roughly 20 kilohertz in bandwidth. Um, so it, it's 27 megahertz plus or minus like 20 kilohertz uh, spacing. So in this case, we have roughly, I think 40 kilohertz to work with uh, in terms of bandwidth, which is more than enough for what we're doing. If you wanted to do some super high data rate application, then you need more bandwidth, but this is fine. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, so once we are transmitting, then our signal goes through the air and we call that part the channel, in this case, a wireless channel. And in general, we represent any, uh, any effects on the signal that, that the signal goes through, uh, which we call impairments. Uh, we call that part of the channel usually. So that might be induced noise, uh, it might be some attenuation. So as your signal gets from point A to B, it'll encounter some loss. There'll be some delay because it takes a finite amount of time for your signal to get from point A to point B and some other stuff. For our purposes, we really only need to consider the attenuation um, because we're, here we're, we're going to use relatively low data rates. So the lower your data rate, the less important noises. Um, but regardless, because of the attenuation, the receiver will need to be able to amplify whatever it receives because the, the signal level will be so low, uh, your microcontroller won't be able to process it. 
so we need to amplify things. Um, so once it gets through the channel, through the air that is, then we get to the receiver part, um, which we I should also mention T, the, tr the transmitter, we usually call it the TX, that, that shows we write it that way, and receiver is RX. So when we get to the receiver, then uh, we uh, have another antenna, of course. And the process there is pretty much the same as the transmitter, except in reverse. So you get an electromagnetic wave, you convert it to a voltage in a, in a circuit or a current. And uh, then you, it gets sent to the next part of the, the system. So the next part of the system is called the no, low noise amplifier. Um, which is where we want to amplify our low level signal from the antenna to something higher that we can process. So in general, in general communication systems, you have some low power signal with noise on it. And you want to amplify it with while minimizing the amount of noise we introduce uh, to the output. So that's where the, the name low noise amplification comes from. Um, and you can also show that the more amplification you do before anything else in the receiver, the greater your signal to noise ratio is. So, uh, and the signal to noise ratio is what really counts in determining how good your uh, receiver is. And so again, once we get to amplifiers, we'll talk more about that. Uh, next, we have down conversion, which is I already talked about that kind of the opposite of up conversion. Uh, then we get to the analog to digital converter. And you know, it's the opposite procedure of the digital to analog converter. We're converting our RF signal to the digital domain uh, on the microcontroller. And we have the same problem here where the, the analog to digital converter can only sample at a, a certain rate which limits the maximum frequency that we can process. Uh, right, there, there's also a, a aliasing problem and I'll talk more about that later. But basically if you're, uh, if you're, uh, the signal you're sampling has frequencies that are too high, then it can kind of interfere with uh, your signal. It causes nasty effects and we'll talk about it. Uh, then once we get to the digital domain, then everything is nice and happy because uh, you can just write that in code. And it's the exact opposite process as the transmitter where you, you demodulate your, your signal, which is basically you're, you're extracting the symbols from what you receive. You're converting the symbols to their bit representation. And from the bits, you have your information and uh, then you're off to the races. <laughs> All right, so to summarize this stuff, um, this is kind of like step-by-step step what we're doing. We're converting our bits to symbols, we're modulating the symbols onto a carrier signal, and then we're converting that digital carrier signal to an analog one uh, through the deck. And then because that signal is a lower frequency, we need to up-convert it to a higher frequency uh, which is what the up conversion stage is. And then we amplify it such that the signal level is high enough once it gets to the antenna. So then the signal is transmitted out of the antenna, goes over the air, and we receive it on the receiver. <clears throat> and the receiver, because once it gets to the receiver, the signal level is pretty low, so we need to amplify it. It does a down conversion step to bring that signal to a lower frequency and then we sample it through the analog to digital converter. And then once we have our sample digital signal, we demodulate it, we get the symbols, um, and we convert the symbols to bits, and then we're done. So uh, any questions on this general path here? Yes, no, maybe so. No, okay. No, okay, maybe so, Caleb says. All right, so 
uh, how, are we, how are we feeling so far? There, there's more. Uh, this is just the first presentation. Um, if I brought up the second presentation, would people get too, too tired? <laughs> Nobody's talking. Do it. Okay, people say they're ready. Okay, so this this uh, will be kind of a review for people that have taken 115A, but I'm hoping it'll be somewhat insightful, uh, even if you have. So we'll, we'll get right into it. Amplifiers, biasing, common emitter. Uh, where will the recording be at the hop off? Um, I believe we're going to post the recording to the, uh, what is it, IEEE YouTube channel, but don't quote me on that. Either way, I'll, I'll let everyone know where the recording is once the recording is up. All right, so what we're going to talk about here. First, uh, Overview of the bipolar junction transistor. Um, and then we're going to analyze. Yes, there's an I, believe it or not, there's an IEEE YouTube channel. Uh, then we're going to look at the large signal analysis, uh, DC biasing, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so bottom line, eventually want to get to this picture here, which is called the common emitter amplifier. And this is going to be one of the major building blocks for this wireless communication system. And hopefully along the way, we'll, we'll learn something. So uh, for those who don't know, bipolar junction transistor is a type of transistor, of course. Uh, the main other type is the MOSFET, or I just FET in general, the metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. Um, and if you've taken other IEEE projects, you've likely used MOSFETs rather than BJTs. And the reason that is, is because they're easier to use for switch applications, like turning something off and on. But when it comes to analog applications where we want to amplify a signal, um, at least at these frequencies, the BJT is a lot easier and better to use in general, um, unless you're working on integrated circuits, in which case all bets are off. But anyway, so we'll mostly be using bipolar junction transistors, specifically the NPN variant. Um, so here's two pictures of them. Uh, one's an NPN, one's PNP. NPN refers to the uh, semiconductor doping profile, but not important here. Um, so the, the main uh, thing of interest for amplifiers is this collector current, which is the current flowing into the terminal labeled C there. Now let me get my, my pointer out. The C. So right, I should also mention C is collector, B is base, E is emitter. All right, so this collector current is kind of important, <laughs> bottom line. OK, so what? how, how do these things actually work? Um, this plot here is important to understand. So what, what this is showing is on the x-axis, we have VCE. That's the voltage between the collector and emitter. Um, and we have IC, the collector current on the y-axis. And then I have three different curves here, one for uh, different levels of VBE, which is the base to emitter voltage. So we, we have two voltages here. One is from collector to emitter and one is from base to emitter. And uh, you notice something kind of interesting here. As we increase, for, for a given value of VBE, as we increase VCE along the x-axis, we shoot up rapidly in this collector current and then it settles off to some kind of flat value. And so there's kind of two different regions of operation here. One is when your current rapidly changes as a function of VCE, and one where it's kind of flat as a function of VCE. 
And this left guy is called the saturation region. The right guy is called the forward active region. And so when you're using the transistor as a switch, like turning something off and on, you mainly operate in this saturation region where you have a low voltage from collector to emitter, which means if, if you have a current flowing through there, um, the power you're dissipating in the transistor is fairly small. So like if you're, if you're trying to turn on a motor, for example, which is running at, I don't know, 100 milliamps, let's say, and uh, your VCE is roughly 0.1 or something like that, 0.1 times 100 milliamps, so V times I, oops, V times I is uh, what, 0 0.01 watts, so 10 milliwatts, that's being dissipated in your transistor. If we were over here where VC is like, I don't know, one volt, let's say, a one volt times 100 milliamps is 100 milliwatts, so that's 10 times higher power dissipation, and that is no bueno. Um, so in general, that, that's, that's the idea behind it. Where that, That's how we want to use the transistor as a switch. But for amplifiers, we do the exact opposite. We want a high voltage from collector to emitter. And that's this region here. And what that allows us to do is control this current by changing VBE. So you can see as we, from blue, red, and yellow, where we're moving VBE up and down, and that allows us to change the collector current um, without the collector current have any um, dependence on VCE. And we'll see why that's important shortly. So for those who haven't taken 115A, does that make sense so far? <laughs> Okay, um, let's see. Yeah, so general rules of thumb, uh, when VBE is roughly 0.6 volts, we say that the transistor turns on. And you see here VBE is 0 0.62, 0 0.6, 0 0.58. Um, when you get much lower than this value, the current is basically zero. And when you get much higher than this value, the current shoots up to some absurd values. So in general, you want to be near this figure. Um, and then the, 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 you know, the cutoff number we say here for between saturation and forward active is when VCE is roughly 0.2 volts. You can see that's where you kind of transition between this, these two regions. So next, um, I think I said all of this. Yeah, okay, next. So here is another kind of view of uh, what, what, what's happening with the transistor collector current. So that this is when, so here I have a five volt uh, voltage source and that means VCE is five volts, which as you recall is much higher than uh, the 0.2 volts, which is the threshold between saturation and forward active. And you, you can ignore these current probe things. Uh, they don't do anything. Um, and then this transistor here, BJT, uh, is this particular model number, but that's not important. Anyway, so VCE is roughly five volts and the base to emitter voltage, I'm, I'm moving up and down. Here I, I've grounded the emitter. So the base voltage is equal to VBE, right? So I'm, I'm increasing the, the VBE from zero volts to 0.8 volts. And you can see at around 0.6 volts, the collector current starts shooting up exponentially. And if you've ever looked at the, uh, um, uh, uh, IV characteristics for a diode, that might look very similar. And sure enough, it's the exact same thing. Um, what, like once the diode turns on, the current shoots up here. Once the, the transistor turns on, the, the current shoots up. So you can kind of think of from base to emitter is kind of like a diode. Uh, so, oops. So next, 
uh, what I did here is I added a resistor uh, between the voltage source and the collector of the transistor. And some interesting things happen here. Well, first it's, it's a one kilo ohm resistor um, and the value will become important later. But anyway, uh, uh, so remember as we increase VBE, the collector of the current that's going into the collector increases, which means that the current going through the resistor increases. And remember that a, a current through a resistor creates a voltage. So the voltage VCE now is five volts minus the voltage across this resistor. And as we increase VBE and the current increases, the, the voltage across this resistor will increase, which means VCE will drop. So at some point, the current will be so high that the resistor will drop a, enough voltage that VCE gets to roughly 0.2 volts. And we go from forward active region to saturation region. And at that point, uh, the changing VBE won't cause much of a change in the collector current anymore because it's dominated by changes in v, the VCE. That makes sense? So this plot here kind of shows what I'm talking about. So on the red is the collector current. And this is kind of the same as we had before. As we go from 0 to 0.6 volts, the collector current starts increasing exponentially. And at a certain point, you can see the, the current kind of rolls off uh, to some flat level, in this case, five milliamps. Um, but in the blue curve here, I'm plotting VCE versus VBE. So at low currents, we're, we start off at five volts. That's what we had before without the resistor. And as the current increases, VCE is gonna drop because we're dropping more voltage across that resistor. So as it drops, eventually VCE gets to roughly 0.2 volts, which is right here. And then it kind of flattens out. And that's because we've gotten to the saturation region. So there's kind of three things that are happening here. To the left here, the transistor is off because VBE is much smaller than 0.6. In the middle, we're in the forward active region because VBE is near 0.6 and we're drawing current. And then once the current becomes too high and VCE becomes too low, we've gone into the saturation region. And now the transistor uh, doesn't really depend on VBE anymore. Now it's more on VCE. So does that make sense to people? If you don't get this, you won't get what's coming next. So speak up now. <laughs> Okay, I have one yep. Okay, so next, next we get into uh, what's actually happening here. So imagine we stuck, uh, put, it, put our uh, VBE, let's say we stuck it to roughly this value here, like 0.62 or something, 0.625, uh, let's say, which is this value here. And let's say we draw a vertical line up and see where it intersects these two blue and red curves. Uh, you see it intersects the red curve right here, which corresponds to a current of one milliamp. And the blue curve intersects right here, which corresponds to a VCE of four volts. So four volts is bigger than 0.2 volts, which means we're in the saturation region here. Uh, so that's all good. And now imagine we wiggle this point left and right on this VBE axis, which is to say we're moving VBE up and down. And that means we're going to move up and down these curves right here. And if you do things correctly, the up and down movement here on VCE will be much larger than the movement of VBE. And so let's, uh, if we take VCE to be the output of the amplifier and VBE to be the input, then we've effectively amplified VBE 
to some level in Gotten BCE, right? And you can kind of guess what what that amplification will be by the, the slope of this line here. Henry says, mind blowing. You're correct. It is mind blowing. So um, if, if I go back here to this slide, you can kind of think of, so VBE moving that up and down will cause a change in VCE, um, I'm sorry, IC, the collector current. And collector current through the resistor will cause a voltage. So we're, we're converting voltage to current and then current back to voltage. And that voltage is the output VCE. So, um, so we can think of the gain of this amplifier, which is to say the output divided by the input as the slope of this line here. Like if you do a, one of those Taylor series expansions or something, and you have like constant term plus, yeah, Caleb, it's always one milliamp. You have your constant term plus uh, like the first derivative times uh, your input and plus some higher order terms. If you look at that first derivative term, that's the slope here. If we have, uh, we're, we're taking our, our uh, the constant, which in this case is 0.625, uh, plus some wiggle on that, and that wiggle times the slope will get you the wiggle on the output. So it's, it's kind of like a, a derivative first order approximation to this function here. But anyway, so I, I wrote that up here. The, the gain is the derivative of VCE with respect to VBE evaluated at whatever uh, collector current we've chosen. You can, you can replace this with VBE or whatever, but basically what, wherever we're, we've operated this transistor at. Um, and then if you work out the math, um, I didn't put the formula here for IC, but it's, it's, uh, it's just some like simple exponential thing. It's not too hard. So if you work out the math, it comes out to minus IC over VT times RC. Remember RC is uh, this resistor here. IC is the current going in here. Then VT um, is called the thermal voltage. It's, a, it's one of those fundamental con uh, constants. Uh, it's roughly 25.9 millivolts at room temperature, but you don't need to remember that really. You can always look it up. And it's cut off here, but we define some value GM equal to IC over VT. And so this becomes minus GM RC, which is pretty simple uh, if you think about it. We, we uh, bias the transistor to some level here. We, we figure out what the current is. We divide the current by VT, which is 25.9 millivolts. Um, that gets you GM. And GM times RC, which is that resistor, gets the gain. So let, let's do some simple calculations here. Oops. So the current here is one milliamp. And one milliamp divided by VT, it comes out to roughly 0 0.04. So uh, if, if you go through the math there. And 0 0.04 times one kilo ohm, which is what that resistor was, gets you 40. And so it turns out that the gain of that amplifier, if you bias it to this point right here, is 40. So you feed in a value of uh, like a, a one millivolt input signal and you get a 40 millivolt output signal. Um, so here, here I plot, this is kind of interesting, I think. Here I plotted this uh, derivative function, which is the gain. So this is the gain of the amplifier at different levels of VBE. And you can see uh, when VBE is much less than 0.6, it's zero because the slope of this line is zero. So you, you change VBE, you get zero change in IC, and thus you get zero output change. But as the current starts to increase and we get closer to the for we get into the forward active region, the gain starts increasing exponentially. Um, at some point you get into the saturation region and then the gain rapidly goes back to zero 
because now a change in VBE doesn't change the collector current. So when you're operating the transistor, uh, you, you want to be in this region here where you get some gain. <laughs> um, we have a question from Caleb. But David, what prevents you from increasing RC to infinity to get infinite gain? I'm glad you asked, Caleb. So right now I have a RC of one kilo ohm, and I had my transistor bias to one milliamp collector current. Now say I changed RC to five kilo ohms. Could somebody tell me what, uh, what would happen? What, what problem we would encounter? Your current IC would also become smaller. But why? Uh, I'm sorry? Well, why, why would the current become smaller? Well, it's the same voltage, right? That's your, your source is. Well, okay, so say, say I, I have one kilo ohm resistor here. Say I changed it to uh, 100 ohms. So I divided it by 10. What would the current change? And the, the, the answer is no, the current won't change. And that's because this transistor is basically setting the current. The VCE will change to whatever it needs to be to maintain that current it had before. And changing VCE will change the voltage across this resistor. And uh, if we wanted one, one milliamp, then the voltage across this resistor will be, if it was 100 ohms, it would be 0.1 volts, if I did my math correctly, which means VCE would be 4.9 volts. So uh, the current won't change there. But now, let's say I changed this to five kilo ohms. What, what problem do you see encountering? I'll also point out that this is five volts here. Remember, we wanted one milliamp going into the transistor. One milliamp through a five kilo ohm resistor has a voltage drop of five volts. So what, what, what problem do you see? Anyone? Someone, please. Too much voltage drop plus RC makes you hit saturation. Yes, correct. So that's the problem. Um, if this is five kilo ohms and we wanted one milliamp, uh, uh, this thing will drop five volts. We'll get zero volts across the transistor. And remember that puts us into the saturation region. So clearly our one milliamp assumption was wrong. So if we had a five kilo ohm resistor here, we could not possibly have a one milliamp current flowing. And so what will actually happen is that uh, uh, VCE will get to roughly 0.2 volts, and then the current won't keep increasing. It'll kind of saturate out to some level. Does that make sense? Nobody answers when I say that, so I'll assume that's a yes. Okay, so next question is, uh, how do we get the transistor biased to this one milliamp or, or something like that. And so the circuit I showed before, which is the one on the left, is not how you do it. The problem here is that, uh, so remember VBE was roughly 0.625 here. But now imagine, uh, so in this circuit here, I have 0.625 volts here and that gets me the voltage across the base to emitter, which sets the current. Now suppose this thing goes up by, let's say 10 millivolts. Let's, let's say our voltage source is not perfect. And uh, you know, it has like a plus minus 10 volt tolerance, 10 millivolt tolerance to it. If I go back to that plot, that's gonna change the uh, collector current dramatically. Uh, it, it turns out the actual figure is that if you increase the VBE by 60 millivolts, 
you're going to increase the collected current by a factor of 10. So by, by going from like 0.6 volts to 0 0.660 volts, I'll go from this point here to 10 times that, which is off the chart or something. Was it off the chart? Could be off the chart. Uh, so that's no good. The problem is uh, changing this voltage by a tiny bit changes the current by, uh, by a huge amount. The other problem is that this transistor, it's a, its a properties depend on temperature. So I might set this to exactly 0.625 volts and I might, might get exactly one milliamp, but your room heats up by like one degree and then everything goes haywire. So we, we need some way to solve that problem. And we solve that problem by using what's called emitter degeneration, which is basically, I stuck a resistor here. And this is kind of interesting. So, Now, uh, I should also mention that uh, I have not mentioned what, what, what uh, current is flowing into the base. Um, did I write that anywhere? I did. So it turns out that the, the, the current flowing into the base is roughly 100 times smaller than the current flowing into the collector. So you can think of the transistor like multiplying the base current by some constant, and that's what the collector current is. It's kind of analogous to using the base voltage to set the current, the collector current. In this case, I'm using the, the I'm saying the base current sets the collector current, but it's it's the same way of looking at the problem, just two different sides to the same coin. But anyway, um, what that means is that the collector current is roughly the same as the emitter current what's flowing out of the emitter. Because the base current is so much smaller than the collector current. If you do, uh, uh, here, let me draw here. If you have a base current flowing here and a collector current flowing here, if you do your Kirchhoff current law, the uh, emitter current, which is flowing out this way, is equal to the base current plus the collector current, which is approximately equal to the collector current because the base current is so small. Yeah. So what I'm getting at here is that the, the emitter current that's flowing through this resistor RE will, will create some voltage VE. And if we can set VE, then we've essentially set IE, which sets IC. Um, now, how do we set VE? Well, remember when I said that this voltage here, which is VBE, is roughly 0.6 volts when the transistor is on. So uh, if I take VB, which is the voltage at the base, subtract 0.6 volts from it, I'm going to get the voltage at the emitter. And so I can set the base voltage easily by using this voltage source, which sets a VE. And VE divided by RE gets me IE, the collector current, and the, the emitter current, sorry. And the emitter current is roughly equal to the collector current. Does that make sense to everyone? So let, let, me, let me give you an example here. So say I wanted IC to be 1 milliamp. So one milliamp going through this resistor here, 500 ohm resistor, gets me a voltage of 0.5 volts. So that means, let me, let me erase all of this here. 
So, oops. Yeah. So that means, oops, I ignore that line. Uh, that means I'll have point five volts here. And can somebody tell me what the voltage at the base would be? Remember that it's it's. Is it one point one? Yeah, exactly. So I'm I'm gonna have roughly. 1.1 volts here. And then, then I, I just set my voltage source accordingly here to be 1.1 volts. And then I get a nice 1, 1 milliamp uh, current flowing through the transistor. Now you might ask, how does that help the situation? Because I'm still just setting a voltage with my voltage source and hoping for the best, hoping that the transistor doesn't change or anything, or temperature doesn't change. And this is where the, the beauty of this approach comes in. So uh, imagine that VBE, oh, sorry, the base voltage increases by a tiny bit, let's say uh, uh, 10 millivolts. That means that the emitter voltage will also increase by roughly 10 millivolts because remember that the, from base to emitter, we still have roughly 0.6 volts, which means now we have 0.51 volts here instead of 0.5 at the emitter. And 0.51 volts divided by 500 ohms is a current of, uh, what is that? 1.1 milliamps. I'm doing my math. I don't think I'm doing my math correctly. Anyway, it's something close to one milliamp. <laughs> Here, let me get the actual number out. 0.51 divided by 0.5 is 1.02 milliamps. So I'm going to get 1.02 milliamps going, oops, going down this way. And that's pretty close to one milliamp. For all intents and purposes, it's exactly the same. And remember in the previous case, we changed our current by 10 millivolts and we had a huge change in the current. So in effect, we've, we've decreased the amplifier sensitivity to changes in the base voltage and makes it a lot easier to set a, a relatively precise collector current. Um, yeah, so any, any questions on that? Okay. So the, the other way to look at this is uh, in terms of negative feedback. So if we increase VB, which results in an increase in, uh, you, you can think of increasing VB as increasing VBE, the base to emitter voltage from uh, here to here. Um, and that'll cause an increase in the collector current. But increasing the collector current will cause the voltage drop across this resistor in to increase, which means VE is gonna increase, which will effectively decrease the base to emitter voltage. So basically increasing VB will cause VE to get pushed up and that'll keep VBE relatively constant, which keeps the collector current relatively constant. How important is the precise value of uh, RE? So you have 500 ohms here. Yeah. So it seems like that uh, effect would kind of the emitter degeneration would occur somewhat regardless of the magnitude of. Yeah, you're, you're right. So what, what you want, the, the way you want to choose RE is you want the voltage across it to be um, on the order of or larger than VBE, so 0.6 volts. So here I have uh, 0.5 volts across uh, RE. 
which is roughly equivalent to VBE. And that'll give you um, good stability. If, if you made RE a lot smaller, so like you know, 10 ohms or something, uh, then you're only going to get point, uh, was it point zero 0.01 volts across it with the 1 milliamp current. And the problem there is that um, that voltage is a lot smaller than VBE. So it's not able to is regulate VBE as well. So what we are trying to do is divide up the base voltage between VBE and uh, the, uh, this voltage across the resistor. And by making the voltage across the resistor more important, uh, you, you reduce the dependence on VBE. And so by making RE bigger, you're increasing its importance in a sense, and uh, at the same time, increasing its voltage across the resistor. So, so by adjusting that resistor, do you somewhat affect the sensitivity of the whole amplifier? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so remember that um, the gain of the amplifier was equal to the derivative of VCE divided by, or the, the derivative of VCE with respect to VBE. And so here we've made, uh, our input is basically now VBE, not VBE, so the base voltage. So now we have to take the derivative of VCE, or, or excuse me, the, the output is now VC, not VCE. The input is now VB, not VBE, because we have this resistor here. And so we have to take the derivative of VC with respect to VB. And remember that we've decreased the sensitivity of the current to changes in VB, which means that the slope of that, that, that line is a lot lower, which means we've significantly decreased the gain as a result. Does that make sense? Yep, thank you. Okay. And we'll see a way of uh, circumventing that problem. So next question is, how, how do we make this more practical? We, we have a five volt voltage source here. We have a 1.1 volt voltage source here. Well, we only need one voltage source actually because we can use a voltage divider to create whatever voltage we want from our five volt voltage source. So in practice, what you'll see is we'll create this VB voltage just using two resistors. Uh, so in this case, uh, what did I do? Um, I wanted a 1.1 volt source here. Did I screw up? <laughs> Oh, I, I just chose a, a different collector current. Sorry. So, if if you if you ignore the current going this way, so just kind of ignore that. Um, can somebody tell me what the voltage is here? Is that one point five five? No, I think it's there. Yeah, it's one point five five volts. So it's it's a uh, you know five times three point one over ten, which gets you one point five five volts. Um, don't ask me why I chose that number. That's a mistake, <laughs> but we can go with it. So, and then what will be the voltage at the emitter? Someone, 0.95 volts, yes. So here we have 0.95. Um, and then the, the current, let's go in this way. What would that be? You, you can round if you want. 0.5. 
It's the one. Give me your current. Yes, two milliamps. So if, if I call this 0.95 just one volt, then one volt divided by 500 ohms gives me two milliamps. And remember that this is also roughly two milliamps. And so everything's nice and happy. Now, now, now we have to come back to this. Why did we ignore the base current? So remember I said that the, the base current kind of controls the collector current as well, because you know that the base current and the base voltage, the base to emitter voltage are interrelated. So one kind of determines the other, uh, kind of like a resistor. So it turns out that the base current is roughly a hundred times smaller than the collector current. So in this case, this current is roughly uh, 20 microamps. Now, that's 20 microamps. Uh, and if I keep ignoring this current here, what would be the current flowing this way? Yeah, through this resistor. Remember, ignore, ignore the base current. So what, what would that number be? Tyler says small. Um, not really. <laughs> well, <clears throat> can, you, can you quantify small? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, the very, very small, okay. Um, what if I drew this? I, I know one of you can answer this. This is five volts. This is 6.9 kilo ohms. This is 3.1 kilo ohms. What is this current? 0.5 milliamps. That's, yeah, correct. So this is, I was right, 0.5 milliamps. Now, what is 0.5 milliamps or 500 microamps compared to 20 microamps? It is much larger, not small, correct. So when, you, when, you, when you're considering this voltage divider, the effect that this 20 microamps has on it is pretty minimal. So you can effectively ignore it when you're calculating this voltage here. So that, that's the rationale behind that analysis. Um, so, and that, that's kind of also how you choose these resistor values. You, if, if, if you're just creating a voltage divider, you have you know, as much freedom as you want to create the value, the, choose the values. All you need is the ratio of the values uh, to be some constant in order to get a fixed voltage here. But because we have this 20 microamp base current, um, you want to choose the current going through the, the voltage divider to be roughly at, at least like 10 times larger than the base current. So I could have gone with 200 microamps here and be fine. Uh, but 500 microamps is fine as well. You can go higher, but then, you, then you're just wasting power. And it'll have also an effect on what's called the input impedance of the amplifier, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. So does everyone, uh, everyone okay with all of this so far? I'll take that as a yes. Okay. Um, so, okay, so now here we have a DC bias. The question is, how are we going to input a signal to it, like a, an AC signal? Um, and how are we going to take out an output, an AC output? So you, you might think, oh, let's just strap a, a signal source here. Let's say that that's our... Um, our uh, uh, you know, voltage source or something. 
So that's our input. And then what we're going to ask them. Oh, OK. And then we take our output right here. Well, there's a couple problems with that. One is uh, if we, on the input side, this, uh, imagine we disconnected, like we, we, we shorted out this voltage source and just kind of went to ground here. Well, now this point is zero volts. That's no good. Um, so like if your, if your voltage source was, you know, had a very small signal, that would cap or like force this base voltage to also be that very small signal. So we're, we're trying to amplify a small signal and we just made our base voltage that small signal. And that means we've effectively killed the nice 1.55 volts we had here for our DC bias. So we need some way of separating our input signal from the DC bias. Um, so don't do this. Now on the output side, we have kind of the same problem. Uh, so if you wanted to uh, send our, our output to the, an antenna, for example, which I'll just call a resistor for now. That's a terrible looking resistor, but, but go with it. Um, what's the problem here? So the problem here is that now we're, we, uh, uh, we're also sending the DC level of the collector to our load. And we're also wasting a lot of power. So the, the reason that is, is because we're, we're not really interested in the DC level of the collector in the base for, or for amplification. Uh, they don't convey any information. What does convey information is uh, whatever AC signal we're feeding in and is being amplified to the output. And say, say this resistor was 50 ohms and the, the collector was sitting at, let's say three volts or something. Then we have three volts going into 50 ohms uh, and what, what current is that? That's like 150 milliamps or something. So we're, we're, we're just wasting a lot of power in that resistor. Um, and it's, it's not, not really uh, an effective way of taking an output if we don't care about the DC level. So the way we get around that is by strapping these capacitors onto it. Uh, they're, they're called uh, you know, coupling capacitors or decoupling capacitors, or, or they, they have many different names for all, all for the same thing. So what have we done here? Um, this, all of this is exactly what we had before. So that, that hasn't changed. What has changed is um, on the input side, we have a capacitor in between our input uh, voltage source and the base of the transistor. And what happens here is that, remember, capacitors at DC are open circuit. And if we go and their capacitor imp impedance decreases as we keep increasing frequency. So if we're feeding in a one megahertz sine wave, into this particular circuit, and we have a one microfarad capacitor right here. One microfarad is at one megahertz. Uh, you could do the math, but it's a pretty small impedance. Was it? It's one over two pi, I believe. So like roughly one over six ohms, which is pretty pretty small compared to the other impedances in the circuit. So you can effectively call it a short circuit. Uh, at the AC frequency. But at DC, it's an open circuit. So we, we've effectively decoupled the AC voltage source from the DC biasing of the transistor. Um, so that, that allows the AC to get to the base of the transistor uh, by, by just going through this capacitor. But the DC level here at, at the, the base of the transistor remains the same. So we have a superposition of DC and AC. Now on the output side, we have another capacitor, 
another one microfarad capacitor, which has small impedance at AC. And we're doing the same thing. We're, we're uh, decoupling the output AC signal from the DC level at the collector. Uh, so if we had, you know, we have DC level, and then on top of that, we have uh, our AC signal. And once we get to the resistor here, the load resistor at the output, we'll only see the AC, not the DC. So does that part make sense to people? I'm going to need an affirmative from someone or a, a negatory. So the AC coming in from D in through the capacitor, um, it doesn't really, I don't know if this is a dumb question, it doesn't go anywhere else and affect the rest of the circuit because of the resistors, is that accurate? Um, it's not that it doesn't go anywhere else. The, the problem we had before, if I go back, was that by sticking the voltage source here directly to the base, um, remember that voltage sources can source infinite current or as much current as they want. So it can force the voltage at the base to be its voltage. So here, um, let's say this voltage was like one millivolt. That says one millivolt. Um, and that would force the voltage here to be one millivolt, including the DC. So the total voltage there would be a one millivolt sine wave. And remember that one millivolt is way less than 0.6 volts, which means our transistor would be off. And then we would get no gain out of the circuit. Um, now, because we stuck the capacitor there, that allows the DC uh, level of this thing to be 1.55 volts through the voltage divider. And then we're superimposing the input AC voltage onto that 1.55 volts. All right, got it. Okay. Yeah, and same thing on the output, except the other way around. Um, and then the, the, the resistors there, if you made these resistors too small, uh, the problem is that that would draw too much current from your uh, AC voltage source. So if this AC voltage source had some resistance, um, you would kind of load down your, your source. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, not today, but another day. Um, so that, that has to do with the input impedance of the amplifier. Okay. I think, think we're getting to the end here, don't worry. Okay, so now the question is, what is the gain of this circuit now? So we, we've done a few things. One is we've added the de degeneration resistor. We've added these two resistors for biasing. Then we've added the two coupling capacitors, uh, decoupling capacitors for the input and the output. And we've attached a load onto the output. So th 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 there's a few things that happened here. Um, so the question is, what is the gain now? And remember at, at the beginning, we just had a a transistor, where we connected the emitter to ground. We had a resistor at the collector. And we had some voltage at the base. We said our gain was minus GM times RC. And we've added all this stuff, so that's no longer the case. So remember when I said that adding the emitter resistor made the transistor collector current a lot more insensitive to changes in the base voltage. So that causes a decrease in the gain. And sure enough, here's the gain equation for this circuit. I should also write in parallel with RL here. Um, 
Um, so the, the gain of this circuit has changed. So let's kind of look at the numbers here. Uh, I, I wrote alpha here. Alpha is just beta over beta plus one. And I, I should also define beta. Beta, <laughs> beta is equal to uh, IC over IB. So beta is called the current gain. And remember, I said this is roughly 100 for most transistors. Uh, bipolar junction transistors, that is. So, and then so beta over beta plus one, that's roughly 100 over 101, which is pretty close to one. So we can kind of ignore the alpha term. So in, in the numerator, we still have the minus RC. In this case, it's in parallel with RL. That's because we've, we've attached a load to it. So that, that's just what happens. Um, in the denominator, we have, we're dividing by something now. So we're, we're reducing the gain. And it turns out this factor is RE plus a number called R pi over beta plus one. Uh, R pi is um, beta over GM. Um, uh, you, can, you can think of R pi as like resistance from here to here. Uh, it's basically linearized the, the diode from base to emitter. But anyway, so let's just call it some number for now. R pi is beta over GM. Uh, in this case, uh, what, what, what is GM? So can somebody tell me what, what the equation for GM? Or maybe, maybe that's hard to remember. Uh, I'll tell you it's IC over VT. And VT is 25. 0.9 millivolts at room temperature. So, and IC remember was in this case is uh, two milliamps. So two milliamps divided by 25.9 millivolts is roughly 0 0.08 around there. So GM is this. So that, that means R pi is uh, 100 divided by 0 0.08, which is roughly uh, 1.25 kilo ohms. If you go through the math. And uh, so now we go back to this equation here. So RE, RE is 500 ohms. So 500 plus 1.25 kilo ohms divided by 101. So that's uh, you know, roughly uh, what 12.5 or so. So 12.5 plus 500. So we're getting 512.5 times minus alpha RC in parallel with RL. Alpha was uh, about one, so we can ignore it. RC is one kilo ohm. RL. Um, I didn't specify that. Well, let's just ignore it for now. So let's say we have RC in the numerator, which is uh, one kilo ohm. So now we have 1,000 divided by 512, and yeah, that's about two. So we, we've gone from a gain of, uh, from minus GMRC, that, that would have been roughly 80, minus 80. This is a minus here. Um, we've gone from minus 80 to minus two. So by adding all of this stuff, mainly RE, we've gone, we've, we've decreased our gain by 40. So you can see the huge effect that that emitter degeneration has on the gain. Did everybody follow that the calculation? I get a thumbs up. Okay. And if we were to include RL, uh, whatever that may be, I didn't specify it here, that would further decrease your gain because RL is in parallel with RC. So that'll create a smaller number. Um, so this equation here, 
is a good one to refer back to. So how do we uh, fix that problem of the gain while keeping the uh, EC bias stable as before? Uh, well, it's a pretty straightforward once you've seen it once or twice. Uh, you add a capacitor in parallel with the emitter resistor. And we can, it's basically the same trick as before with the capacitors. Um, at AC frequencies, high frequencies, the capacitor is a short circuit essentially. And a short circuit in parallel with the resistance is just a short circuit. So at AC, we're basically connecting the emitter to ground, which brings us back to that nice case where the gain was minus GMRC. So, and at DC, there's, there's no effect because the capacitor is an open circuit. So what have we done? We've created a, an amplifier that has a stable DC bias. Its gain is minus GMRC, which is large. Well, in this case, it's 80, minus 80. And uh, we have our input and output decoupled from the DC. Uh, so we, we feed in an AC signal and we get out an AC signal. And we call this the common emitter amplifier. Uh, so that's that's nice. Um, as promised in the table of contents for this PowerPoint, this is the circuit we wanted to end up with. Uh, and we, we got there, so that's good. <laughs> uh, do I have anything after this? Yes, okay, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and let's see, there's something more I wanted to say. Uh, Oh yeah, the, the other thing is, I forgot to mention, there's a minus sign here. And I, I never actually explained where that minus sign came from. So let, let me let me go back a little bit here. Oops, no, no, go away. Oh, now there's subtitles. <laughs> this, yeah, yeah, that's what I want, okay. Uh, here we are. Here's what I want to go back to. Okay, now, now, let me explain the minus sign here. So if we increase VBE, that's cause, gonna cause an increase in the collector current, remember? And that'll cause a decrease in the collector to emitter voltage. So an increase in the input causes a decrease in the output. And that's where the minus sign comes from. Uh, and so, I mean, clearly the slope of this blue curve is negative. So always remember that the, uh, the uh, from input to output of the common emitter amplifier, we're gonna cause a phase shift of 180 degrees, basically multiplying by minus one. And that, that minus line is important. Okay, so that's all fine and good. Any, any questions about everything I've said so far? We're, we're almost to the end here. Uh, less conceptual, but um, is there any sense to how you chose uh, one microfarad for the capacitors? Or is uh, that just arbitrary? Yeah, that, that was relatively arbitrary. Um, right. what, what you want to do is uh, choose those capacitor values such that their reactants at the frequencies of interest are much less than the resistances in the circuit. So it's, it's pretty clear in the like in this case here, I want the reactance of the capacitor to be much less than 500 ohms. And one microfarad satisfi satisfies that, you know, pretty easily. because it's like one over six or something. Um, but, I, but I could have, like if we were operating at one megahertz, then I, I could have chosen like 10 nanofarads or something, and it would have worked okay. So it's not that critical, as long as it's large enough. The, the, I mean, if you make it too large, then your capacitors become too big. If you make them too small, then 
uh, they're, they're not going to have a, they're just going to block your AC. So it's, it's a trade off. Any other questions? Um, I, I should also mention that I wrote up a uh, uh, like, I don't know, how many pages, like 10 pages or so about this stuff. And I'll, I'll post that in the Google Drive in a uh, couple of days, maybe over the weekend or something. Um, so that, that, that should clear up things as well. So anyway, we get to the, the fun stuff for you. So of course, there's going to be assignments in this project. And the first one, I'm uh, tentatively making it due Friday next week. I don't, I don't think it'll take that long. Um, but you know, there's like three steps here. One, install software. That's easy. Uh, LT Spice is the circuit simulation software we're using. That'll take maybe five seconds to install. There's MATLAB, which we'll be using for the communication simulations. That'll take maybe five hours to install. Uh, <laughs> I think it's, it, most of you should have it installed already, but if you don't, um, uh, UCLA offers it for free if you search a little. If you, if you have trouble installing it, let me know. Um, then step two. Design a common emitter amplifier with bypass degeneration with the following specs. So you're going to use this particular transistor model from LT Spice. It's built in, and I'll, I'll, I'll write up uh, like basics of how to use LT Spice, uh, and I'll, I'll post that also during the weekend or something. Um, you're going to want your amplifier to have a voltage gain of. I should write minus 40, not positive 40. That should be minus. Um, the base collector current should be 1 milliamp. And the DC voltage at the collector should be 2.5 volts. This may look a little familiar. And it should, <laughs> because that's basically what uh, this presentation was, at the beginning at least. Um, the, the only thing that's different is this collector voltage should be two and a half volts. And uh, um, yeah, that, that shouldn't be, I mean, you, you can kind of figure it out from the equations, but if you have trouble, let me know. Um, and the other stipulation is to use a five volt DC supply. And then there's, there's some, uh, uh, amplifier parameters I'll want you to obtain, such as the input resistance, the output resistance, and the gain. And I'll, again, I'll write that up. So uh, expect an email from me in a couple days with all this stuff. And I, I hope you learned something. So <laughs> any questions? Yes, no. So, so for the LT spice simulation, we don't need to include an AC input signal? Uh, you, you do. So in order to obtain these values, step three, oh, okay. um, you'll, you'll need to input some AC signal. And there, there's different ways of doing that. So that there's, I don't know, how, how much time do you guys have? I can keep going for ever. <laughs> I, I can show you a quick demo of uh, Spice here. Oh yeah, Zane asked um, uh, if MATLAB is free. Uh, Zane, you, so you aren't part of the Henry Samueli School of Electrical, uh, School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And I believe the MATLAB licenses are through the engineering school. Um, 
but I think you can finagle your way around it. Yeah, 2017 version should be fine. Uh, Caleb asks, can you further explain what you mean by step three? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll write up exactly what, what I'm looking for in a, uh, in a, in a document. And that should explain what more you need to find. Um, there, there's some nifty tricks to get things like input impedance and output impedance in Spice. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of show you that um, in a thing I'll post in a couple of days. So uh, here's Spice, just quickly. Here, here's what it looks like when you open it. You get this weird coffee stain thing. Um, so let me, let me just open something I made here. Uh, I'll just make it. So I'll, I'll create a new schematic and I'll drop in a BJT transistor. I'll set the transistor to be the 2N4401. And I'll explain these steps in a document. I'll add a resistor, another resistor, another resistor, and another resistor. Move that over a bit. And I'll have an input coupling capacitor, an output coupling capacitor. And I have a What's voltage the keyboard source. shortcut for rotate? <laughs> it's, uh, oops, it's control R. Thank you. Yes. So, let me stick a load resistor and I'll have a voltage source for it here and then I'll connect everything up. So this is the kind of tedious stuff here. Make sure that you see a dot here. If there's no dot here, these two aren't connected. Uh, I've fallen into that trap a few times. Okay, so I'll just copy what I had on the slides. It was a, what is it, a 3.1 kilo ohm. This is a 6.9 kilo ohm. This is a 1 kilo ohm. It's 500 ohms. This is 1 microfarad. That's also 1 microfarad. And I have a capacitor here that is 1 microfarad. Oops. And the load resistor, I'll just make it something huge so it doesn't affect the circuit. And I'll make this 5 volts. And then on the input, I'll make a sine wave that has a very small amplitude, like 1, one millivolt or something. Frequency, I'll just choose 10 kilohertz arbitrarily. And I think we're good to simulate here. So I press the running guy at the top. And it asks me to set a stop time. So that's how. Uh, how long the simulation will simulate for. So a 10 kilohertz signal has a period of 100 microseconds. So maybe I want 10 periods, so I'll choose one millisecond. Okay, so on the input, you see we have a sine wave, one millivolt amplitude, 10 kilohertz. On the output, which is in, these colors are terrible, I mean, maybe red or something. Okay, so, Input is green, output is red. You can see that red is much larger than green. And the, the amplitude here, let me uh, add a little cursor. The amplitude here is 43.5 millivolts. So it's, it's roughly 40, 40 millivolts, um, which is 40 times the input signal. And if I zoom in a little here, well, that doesn't help at all. But if I kind of go like this, you can see that it's this guy is going up here and reaches a peak roughly at this point to read the input, which means that the input is 180 degrees out of phase with the output, or roughly 180 degrees. Um, uh, so does that make sense? Um, Caleb asks, is there a phase shift? Yeah, there is. Um, if I make these capacitors a lot bigger, um, yeah, that fixes the phase shift. 
So the problem there is that these capacitors were too small for the 10 kilohertz. And that caused a phase shift of the input, uh, output with respect to the input. And uh, that's just kind of a trap to look out for. If I, if I brought these back, back down to one microfarad and then change the input frequency to one megahertz and change the simulation time accordingly. So uh, let's say 10 microseconds. Oops. Uh, stop time is 10 microseconds. I don't think that worked. And microseconds. There we go. Then you'll see uh, the phase shift is gone with these one microfarad capacitors. So, any questions on this? Um, I've gone for like two hours and 15 minutes so far. So, I've, <laughs> I've been talking too long. Um, so, I'll, I'll send out a couple of things either tomorrow or over the weekend which should explain the assignment and uh, more about amplifiers to those that need the explanation. And yeah, I guess that, that's it for lecture one. I hope everybody's excited as me. So if nobody has any questions, I'll call it a day. Yes, no. The excitement is palpable. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, I'll stop.